Reggie Miller, one of the greatest shooters of all time. Ultimate competitor. Here's Miller trying for another three. Reggie was always ready to step up. Miller, oh, one of the best clutch shot makers in the history of the NBA. The guy that always wanted the ball in the last few seconds of a game. And if he got it, he usually knew what to do with it. Miller for three. And he got it. And a steal. Miller retreats to the three-point line. And it's the game. Reggie Miller has tied the game with 13 seconds remaining. The game is never over until it's over. He, he played out of his mind that game. One of the most remarkable comebacks in all of basketball. Oh, he's a Hall of Fame. I mean, that, I mean it's simple as that. Playing against Reggie and coaching Reggie and, and knowing his personality, Reggie's hit more shots uh, in crucial times than about anybody I've ever seen. Uh, being elected to the Hall of Fame is, is the ultimate. It, it's the, uh, the icing on the cake for everyone. It's a great honor. I, I think everybody respects Reggie because he came out and played hard every night. People always talk about how Michael Jordan came out and played hard. Uh, Reggie came out and played just as hard. While Reggie Miller earned the respect of nearly everyone he played against, the reverse was not always the case. An opponent had to prove himself worthy of Reggie's admiration with sustained greatness. And that's exactly what Michael Jordan did, time and time again. Michael Jordan, what do you remember about playing him when you guys were on the floor and he was guarding you and you were guarding him and they had, I'm sure, some terrific shootouts over the years between just the two of you? You know, looking back over 18 years, you'd have thought that Michael and I, the Bulls and the Pacers, would have played more than once in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. We only played once and it was that epic seven game series. You're measured by your competition. He is clearly and in my opinion, the best basketball player I've ever seen to date. And I knew that I had to bring it each and every time I stepped on the court when I was going against MJ. Were you friends? No. Now Michael Jordan and Reggie Miller having a go at it. And I mean, we had this going. Here come the benches. Bo Hill is out there. Uh -oh. Bill Jackson's going out there. There'll be fines handed out all over the place here. But more importantly, what in the world ignited this? We weren't friends. We talk to each other on the floor? He might have been the one player I didn't talk to. Really? Yeah. Because he might have been the one player who could really embarrass you. <laughs> and he could come back at you pretty yes. good too. Could yeah, he? he could come right back at you. I wanted what he had. Him being the best, mm -hmm. the championships. So I watched, I listened, and I tried to learn a lot by playing against him. And what did you learn? What couple things you took away from what he did or how he played or how he acted? He is cut from the same mold as Magic Johnson. And when I say that, and Larry Bird, all three of those players, win by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. And they will do whatever it takes on the court to win a game. And you adopted that? I tried to adopt that, mm -hmm. yeah. You had to be textbook when you played the Bulls and you played against Michael. You know, Reg, it's interesting because I think when you think of Jordan, you think about the dunks. You were a shooter. Uh, our games were vastly yes. contrast. You know? yeah. His was more power, dunking. Mine was more shooting, finesse. But for some reason, I think my style at times irritated him because I was in constant motion. He used his power to control players and to keep them where he wanted them. He had great torque. Yes, he did. Just the way and he let me say this about Michael. Probably, if not the, one of the smartest basketball players. You mm -hmm. know, you talk about his ability to be athletic and all that, but he was a very smart basketball yeah. player. He thought the game through. Yes, yes. You thought the game and through. And he knew what your weaknesses were, mm -hmm. and he tried to exploit them. McKee gets it in the middle for the win! It's there! Oh, Four-tenths of a second! Because that was another game where I felt that we had let slip away, because Michael was being Michael and dominating, along with Scotty and, and Dennis. There wasn't a lot of time left on the clock. At the time, Ron Harper was guarding me, and I knew Michael was going to switch off <laughs> when I came up top. And I said to myself, well, they're not going to call offensive foul. So when I came up, 
I was just so upset that we had let this game slip away from us. I basically just shoved Michael. I just pushed him out of the way, daring the officials to call offensive foul because I was so upset. And when I didn't hear the whistle and I had so much space and I went off to my left and Derek threw me the basketball, and now you just go into mechanics. If I had known that I had that much space, I probably would have shot it differently and probably missed it. But I assumed he was right on my tail. So catch, release, and let it go. And the rest is history. Clearly, friends or not, Reggie respected Jordan immensely. But he may not have realized how much respect others had for him. In an unheard of tribute, Pacers teammate Jermaine O'Neal illustrated the high regard in which Reggie was held. To set the stage, we go back to November 28, 1992, when Reggie torched the Charlotte Hornets for 57 points, setting the Pacers' single-game scoring record. It's a mark that still stands today, but there was a night when it could have been broken. On January 4, 2005, the Pacers' young center O'Neal was dominant. With just under two minutes to play, O'Neal had torched the Milwaukee Bucks for 55. But rather than carving his own name in the history books, he demonstrated the ultimate respect for his teammate, checking out of the game with a minute 43 left to preserve Reggie Miller's record. May 6, 2000, and Reggie Miller is having one of those nights against the 76ers in the Eastern Conference semifinals, knocking down seven three-pointers on his way to 40 points. His teammate Jalen Rose matches him shot for shot, going 16 for 23 from the field for 40 points of his own. That night, the duo became the highest scoring tandem ever in an NBA playoff game. ESPN's Jalen Rose was Reggie's teammate for five and a half seasons in Indiana, including the one that led the Pacers all the way to the NBA Finals, and he joins us now via Cisco Telepresence. How are you both able to get into that kind of a rhythm? Well, you guys showing Kobe Bryant scoring 81 points on me all of the time. So sometimes when a player gets going, it's something special when a teammate gets going also. And we see so many great duels in the NBA that have yet to accomplish this feat. Dwayne Wade, LeBron James, Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant. You've seen some great duels that were not able to pull this off in playoff basketball. So it was just a special night. And what made it more special is I was in the late 30s, 38, 39, and we knew I got close to 40. They got a technical free throw. We made a conscious effort to put me on the line instead of Reggie Miller, who's our 90% free throw shooter, so we can make sure I got to the 40, and that would be a historic moment. Thanks for your thoughts on your old teammate and the uh, soon-to-be Hall of Famer, Reggie Miller, and great to talk to you as always. No talk about Hicks versus Knicks. 2000, beat the Knicks in the garden to go to the Eastern Conference Finals. Reggie Miller jumps in my laps and embraces me. A little kid from Detroit getting the chance to play with a great Hall of Famer. Congratulations, Reggie. I love you like a brother. You really deserve it. Relationships were incredibly important to Reggie, but the competitive nature of professional sports makes it very difficult to find friends you can absolutely trust. Reggie talked to Kevin Harlan about one man, once a bitter rival, then a spectacular teammate who became a true friend. Was your best friend in the league a member of the Pacers or is he someplace else? And who, and he who? was a member of the Pacers, uh, Mark Jackson, no question. He was the one guy um, during those... He just connected. Yeah. And he's a New York kid. He, and you're an L.A. kid. Yes. But we played a lot during high school basketball, AEU, and, and so forth. So I, I kind of knew of him and his reputation. And then he won Rookie of the Year, our rookie year. Um, and uh, everything that happened to him in New York and them kind of, you know, turning their back on him and then us getting him, he was the one guy that I knew if I was going to ever beat the Knicks, he was the one guy I wanted to go to battle with. And we would stay up late. We would talk game plan. We would talk players, we would laugh, we would cry together. He's a very spiritual man. He was one, he's one guy that probably along with maybe a Dale Davis that I could I, I know for 100% they have my back. It's great when someone comes along your path and has that kind of influence. It's rare, yeah, Kevin, it's I rare. Know, I, I mean, as a pro athlete, I'm sure it is rare. You know, and it's hard to trust 
sometimes your teammates and other players on, on different teams uh, and regular people, I trust those, I trust those guys. Yeah. Reggie was just outstanding. I mean, I, uh, anything I asked him to do, he was willing to do it because he wanted this team to win and he wanted to show the world that uh, our game was the best. Although Reggie Miller never won an NBA championship, losing to the Lakers in Indiana's only trip to the finals, he was a key figure on Dream Team 2 during the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. The team was split between holdovers from the first Dream Team, including Charles Barkley and David Robinson, and the newcomers, of which Reggie was the leading scorer. He told Kevin Harlan that going for gold was a journey like no other. How about playing and representing your country, not just a city or a state or an individual team, but your country? Well, after seeing in Barcelona and the original Dream Team, I knew in 96 I had to be a part of that, especially being in Atlanta. And I knew a lot of the same players that played on that team, Charles, Scotty, uh, David Robinson, John Stockton, Carl, they were on that original Dream Team. So I had to find, my, find some kind of way to get on that team. And international play is a little bit different from the NBA, so I knew they needed shooters. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, when I got the call, and I knew they had Mitch Richmond on the team, so that's a highlight of my career because you're playing with the same guys you're trying to trip, hold, elbow to win a championship. Now they're on your side. Now let's go take on the world. And the world was just kind of kept beginning to make they their were move, starting, weren't yeah. they? Yes. They, they were starting, and I knew at some point in time, you know, they would... They have caught up to us. Yeah, um, I think the original Dream Team averaged, you know, 42 margin point of victories. Ours dipped to 33, so it started to <laughs> it started yeah. to slip down there. Yeah. They started to catch up yeah. there, but uh, we had a hell of a team. Where's your gold medal? Here in California, in a in a drawer. I don't display it like a lot of other people. When was the last time you put it on? Especially after the Olympics and what the wonderful collection did in London this past summer. For good luck, during the championship game, I brought it out and wore Did you really? for the final game between Spain and, and the USA. Just for, hey, we're all one, right? You know, I wanted those guys to win, so I brought it, wore it for the whole game and then put it back in the drawer. I know the medal's great, but when they play the national anthem mm -hmm. with your teammates, yeah. that had to be worth everything. You know, you, you listen to the athletes and you hear a lot of uh, the gymnasts and everything talking about, you know, when they get onto the podium, people don't understand. You know, you hear it before every ball game and all that and you take it for granted. But when you are representing your country and especially in a team setting and you guys all step up at the same time and it's only your anthem, there's, there's no better feeling. Reggie Miller, I love him. And I'm, I'm very happy that he's been inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame because he deserves it. Great competitor. And uh, he killed the Knicks. <laughs> Bottom line, he killed us. But I still don't like the Pacers. <laughs> still don't like Reggie. You know, we get along now, but, you know, every now and then when I see him, I still want to smack him. When, when we were in a close game, and the ball was in his hands, the Pacers were in good shape. Few players have welcomed the spotlight quite like Reggie Miller, who saved his greatest theater for the grandest of stages. And in the NBA, no stage plays bigger than the Mecca, Madison Square Garden. Reggie talked to Kevin Harlan about his rivalry with the New York Knicks and their most vocal fan, Spike Lee, battles that transcended the game itself. 94 was the Pacers coming out party, yeah. but it really started in 93. We had played them in the first round series the year before and lost in five games. That's when I kind of knew that we could compete on that stage. You fast forward to 1994 in the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, we beat Atlanta, who I thought was the number one seed at that time. And now you're going against the number two seed, the bullies on the block, <laughs> the number one media market, Patrick Ewing, Pat Riley, and the Knicks. And you're on center stage. This is for you, Indiana. We're coming back. Yeah. What I just said, I wanted to put Indiana on the map. Well, what better place to do it than going against the number one media market team and the Knicks. And then the things that come with the Knicks, like some of their fans. So I met Spike a few times. We weren't buddy-buddy or cool or anything like that. 
So we played uh, the Knicks a couple times during the regular season. We caught fire. You know, we beat Orlando. We beat Atlanta. Now we're getting ready to play the Knicks. And I get a phone call, and it's Spike. And he's like, oh, do you want to make a little wager? I'm like, sure, I'll make a wager, because we're going to do you guys. He's like, OK. Well, what do you want? Well, you know, my wife at the time, who was trying to be an actress, it's like, OK, well, put her in one of your, you know, do the right thing movies. No kidding. Yeah. And if it's the Knicks won, he wanted me to go visit, at the time, Mike Tyson was in jail in Indiana uh. because of everything that had happened to him. He wanted me to go visit Iron Mike. So that, that's kind of what set the stage between he and I. 25-point fourth quarter. Swings away and hits! 39-point game, June 1st, 1994. What do you remember from that game, and I guess in particular that quarter? You talk about out-of-body experiences. <laughs> that might have been the third or fourth time I've had that feeling on the court. Miller open again! I'm going to either shoot my way in, I'm going to shoot us out. Look at this shot. And he hits it. It's a three-pointer for Reggie Miller. Well, I started to make my first couple shots at the start of that fourth quarter. And I started to look over at Spike a little bit. And he was kind of, <laughs> things started to come out my mouth. And Reggie Miller in an animated discussion with Spike Lee. The looks, the taunts. Who again is staring in the direction of, yes, that man. You know, the finger pointing, grabbing, choking, and magic was born. Did you ever wonder if he hadn't been sitting there and egging you on, if your performance would have been that good? Or did that, did that fuel it? I think it kind of fueled it because when I started to make some of those crazy shots, you know, I almost made one from half court. I'm like, this, what is going, this is like a video game that's going on right now. If it wasn't for the looks and the antics, it probably wouldn't have been the same. What do your teammates say to you during timeouts? What were guys from the Knicks saying to you on the floor? They had to just be going, holy smokes. I remember Byron Scott and Sam Mitchell coming up to me with towels and fanning me down. They weren't, I was like in a different zone. So in timeouts, Larry Brown would be talking and I wouldn't hear it. I wasn't hearing a word he was saying. I was just in my own little world. Let's just go play. Um, I don't care what happens. We're going to do this. And yes, yeah, so I was having, I was in my own world. In 95, what, eight points in 8.9 seconds. Walk me through that, that thing, because that was just like it was, uh, it was like a movie. Yeah. Look, I was so disappointed and dejected in that game because I felt we had played well enough to win it. We hadn't done all the little things, the rebounding, the loose ball, the 50-50 balls, you know, missed free throws. And it seemed that they were going to win that game. And we were only down six points at the time. And I knew if we got a quick three, uh, you know, then they're going to play the free throw game. You know, we would have a shot to win it. Miller for three, and he got it. <laughs> and I kind of nudged Greg Anthony, and he fell. I didn't know Anthony Mason was going to throw me the basketball again. And I made the three, so I knew they didn't have any timeouts. When he threw the basketball to me, I easily could have gone in for a lay-in. But I was like, well, we're down three. Let me just scoot back, and if I make the three, great. It's tied up, if not, oh well. So as soon as he got it, one dribble back, I made the three. And then I think everyone got caught up in the emotion, including Sam Mitchell, because maybe he thought we were down one, but it was tied up. He fouls John Starks as soon as the ball comes in. And we're running up to him like, what are you doing? It's tied. And I'm like, it's, oh, it's OK. It's all right. Because yeah. worst case scenario, we could score at the other end. If he makes both of these, we could score at the other end, and we'll just go to overtime and take our chances. I didn't know John Starks was going to miss two free throws at home. And then I get the rebound foul. That's where the eight. That's all came. she wrote. That's all she wrote. He was a warrior um, and, and while playing. I mean, he took on, and sometimes he just took the team on his shoulders. Sometimes, and he made us better by him working as hard. And you didn't want to let him down by doing anything less. He was amazing. Even when he retired, I think he could have played another five years. Um, his body, you know, people used to say he was thin and weak, not tough. He was strong, and tough, and competitive. Reggie's durable 18-year career gave him the opportunity to set a number of career marks. On March 18, 2001, he not only surpassed 2,003 pointers made, but eclipsed the 21,000 total points mark as well.
Reggie ended his career as the most prolific three-point shooter in NBA history, a record since broken by Ray Allen. When Reggie began his 18th year in the league, he had no idea it would be his final season. But as he told Kevin Harlan, the decision to retire came down to one very unpleasant moment. In the later stages of your career, one of the darkest times in the NBA was the brawl of Auburn Hills. Mm -hmm. Walk me through that night, that incident, and then we'll talk about the aftermath in a second. But walk me about through what was going on. I was off the shelf the start of the year. We were just coming back from losing to Detroit the year before, and I thought it was our best year probably to win the championship mm -hmm. with this new core. Steven Jackson was just added to the team, Ron Artest, Jermaine O'Neal, Al Harrington. You know, we had a pretty good, nice young nucleus coached by Rick Carlisle. Yeah. In hindsight, I, I kind of wish I would have gone to Coach Carlisle and told him to pull the starters. Something was in the air. I, I can't put a finger on it. Ron got into it with Ben Wallace and the fans started to jaw. And, Ron is laying on the scores the, the table, scores yeah. table, and I have my hand on Ron, saying, "You know, calm down, everything is okay." And out of the corner of my eye, I see an object, you know, coming towards us. You know, it was a cup, and it hit Ron. And I tried to grab him, and he just leaped over the scores table and went into the stands. And my first inclination was to try to hold everyone back, but I was like, "I got to go get Ron." So I jumped over and I went after Ron to grab Ron. And then Steven Jackson is jumping in the stands, and then all hell breaks loose. Do you ever wonder, had you been suited up that night, if there might have been a different feel for your team? When you're in civvies, yeah. and you're not playing, you're, you're with the team, but you really aren't, you know what I'm saying? You're mm -hmm. not with the team. I'm a control freak. And I, I think I could have controlled it better. If playing, you got the uniform If on, you have the uniform on. on the floor. You can dictate things mm -hmm. better, mm -hmm. and you can kind of tell. When you're playing, you can tell when tensions are rising, and you can see that something was on the floor, the flagrant foul with Ben Wallace, and I don't know who it was against. You can see that, but if you're in the middle of it and you're hearing the talking that's going on between the lines at the free throw line, then you know something's getting ready to happen, and that's when you can be like, hey, coach, it's time to pull the starters. Did that change any way you thought about anything about yourself, about your teammates, about the game? That was the time when I knew it was time for me to retire. It was a much younger game. The respect level of it had, had left, I thought. And at that point in time, I didn't tell anyone, but I knew in my mind that it was time for me to retire. We talked about the fans of Indiana and how they're all in. I think that that left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, that, that brawl, that scene. Maybe for the first time, basketball wasn't enjoyable for me. And the maturity level wasn't the same. And trying to teach them respect, to be on time, and to go over the playbooks, and they didn't want to have any parts of it. They just wanted to have fun. A lot of these younger players just wanted to show up, and it frustrated me. Did you enjoy when it was your time to be a mentor? Did I you, loved it. Did you, and, who, and who were some of your pupils? Al Harrington, the best. At, t at the time, Steven Jackson. Though at times he could be a little rough around the edges, deep down, I know Steven Jackson has a good heart. Jermaine O'Neal, he was my locker mate right next to me. And him and Ron constantly had problems. And it was my job to bring them together because if they ever would have gotten it right and they never did, those guys could have won multiple championships, which would have helped me win a championship because we had the best perimeter defender at the time, a young Ron Artest, and the best low post defender at the time, Jermaine O'Neal, on one team. And I was trying to get them to understand if they can communicate and don't worry about the offensive end, the offense will take care of itself. If they could come together and set aside their differences on whose team it is, it's neither of y'all's team. It's not even my team anymore. Let's just play together. I couldn't get, that was one of my failures to get them to play together because they could have been so good together. It's sad, isn't it? It, it really is because uh, we, we had a hell of a team. Now the end is, is on your doorstep. Well, because I didn't think I was gonna retire that year. 
I only knew I was going to retire after the brawl happened. Maybe if they would have known all along that this was my last year, maybe they, the brawl doesn't happen. Maybe they don't go into the stands mm -hmm. um, because they knew they were going to get you know, suspended or suspensions were going to come down. Uh, maybe those actions don't happen if they know. But I didn't think I was going to retire that year until everything went down. In May 2005, your last game, 27-point mm -hmm. game at age 39, Four of eight shooting threes, I think, that day. Yeah. So you had your good stroke going. What's going through your mind on that day? Well, you're, first and foremost, you're hoping that's not it. You're hoping to try to get the series back to Detroit. But we're going against the defending champion. And Larry Brown, I know the mentality that he has to go for the jugular. As time is ticking off the clock and you know that you're not going to you know, force that game back to Detroit, that's when you start to replay everything in your head when it comes to basketball, to getting your shot blocked by Cheryl, to getting up early and running, as we call it, the hill, and then in Riverside, you know, with your dad, saying, all right, sprint, sprint down, to, you know, playing your first high school game and scoring all I wanted to ever do in, in high school was score double di digits. <laughs> to that first game, to getting, signing that letter of intent to UCLA, you start to replay all that because this is it. At a competitive level, this is it. And when I knew the game was in doubt and that they were gonna win and that I heard the buzzer and Fred Jones, I believe, was coming in to sub for me, which was a class act by Rick Carlisle, I couldn't hold it back. Didn't Larry call a timeout too for the Pistons? Then he called the timeout right after that, too. So, and then they applauded you, too. Right, and then they team. came over. That, that was probably the toughest, is when Tayshawn and Chauncey and Rip came over, because you know during, this, during a series, you try to do anything to win, and there's so much contention, and you're going back and forth, and we've had two years of this now between the Pacers and the Pistons, and for all of them to come over and say, we idolized you. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. To some extent, all Hall of Famers are measured by their statistical accomplishments, and Reggie Miller compiled impressive numbers. In 18 seasons with the Pacers, Miller racked up the third most games by a player representing a particular franchise. Only Hall of Famers Carl Malone and John Stockton played more games for one team. Like Stockton, Reggie racked up all these remarkable numbers wearing a single uniform. We'll be back in a moment to cap Reggie's accomplishments with the greatest honor of all, his call to the Hall. Well, he's a Hall of Famer. I mean, and that, I mean, as simple as that. Uh, I thought he would be on the ballot last year. He should have been. But nevertheless, he's a Hall of Famer now and is well-deserved. I'm really happy for him. Reggie Miller became eligible for enshrinement in Springfield in 2011 but he wasn't selected by voters in his first go-around. When the phone rang in 2012, sharing his call to the hall with a very special family member made it even more memorable. Welcome to the Hall of Fame, Reggie Miller. The second call after I found out that I was going into the Hall of Fame was to my dad. Oh. And... Well, is, how old is he now? Uh, he's, he's pushing 90. Right about 90. Yeah. And... Uh, what do you say? I've been waiting for this day. Ah. And for him to say, you know, I've been waiting on this day and, you know, I'm so happy for you, son, and this is great. And, um, it's, it's surreal to have a brother and sister. It's... Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to get affirmation from a parent, isn't it? Yeah, people don't understand that. Yeah, I know. It's I nice. Know. Yeah. Sorry about the eyes. <laughs> Told you don't do that. <laughs> Uh, I saw back in 2007 they tried to get you to come out of retirement yeah. and that the they was the Boston Celtics and right. what what was the process to figure out at 42 you could possibly join Garnett and Ray and Pierce and Boston who by the way went on to win an NBA championship that, that year, year. Yeah. yeah the moves that just happened to bring Ray and uh, KG so this is August this is August of 07. Uh, I would say late August yeah and uh, I get the phone call that 
you know, they're thinking about adding me to the roster. Danny called me and was like, look, I think you'd be a great piece. You know, you can come off the bench, which I had no problems with doing, you know, play 15, 20 minutes a game, spread the floor. Uh, had you been working out? Did, no. Did you ever stop working out when you, when you stopped playing? I did. I, I've always been a workout fanatic, but not basketball. I had done more mountain biking, right. road biking, okay. you know, running, um, 10Ks, things like that. But not like a that. bunch of shooting. N not a lot of shooting. Yeah. You know, some. Some, yeah. some pick up games with the Pepperdine kids and things like that, but nothing serious where I'm going every single day. So I hadn't picked up the basketball in a while, and I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. So I went out and, as we call it, I went to shock my body. And it was the end of August, and the Celtics, he needed an answer within two weeks because they were getting ready to go over seas to Italy or they France. went to Rome, right. They yeah. went to Rome yeah. to play in some type of tournament, a bonding trip for the Celtics, and he needed to know before then. I always tell Danny this and tell people, if he had called in July and given me all summer. Like a two-month leave. If he had given me two months, it was too hard for me to shock my body in those two weeks, yeah. which I tried. I, so I went and I did three days, actually. Did you? to try to shock my body, and it, though the shooting was there, my legs weren't there. And if my legs aren't there, there's no way I can do an 82-game schedule. 1,389 NBA games played. 2,560 three-point shots made. And 18 years, same team, five-time All-Star, three-time All-NBA, mm -hmm. appear in the finals. It was a good little ride there. At the end of the day, ultimately, you know, people judge you on winning championships, but it's the ride in between that is so great. It's the, the up, journey. the journey of the ups and the downs, you know, the teammates along the way from Riverside Poly Bears to UCLA Bruins to 18 years with the Pacers through six to eight different head coaches along the way, you learn a lot about yourself. You grow up. You know, at times you can be so immature when you're in high school and college and a little bit in the NBA. But, you know, I've always felt myself, if I surrounded myself with positive people, which I did, good things are going to happen. And I didn't win the ultimate prize, which is a championship, but damn it, it was so fun trying. I loved it. We leave you with the image of Reggie's jersey being retired on March 30th, 2006. A constant reminder of a career that was truly unforgettable.